it doesn't matter how much money you make, it's how much of that you keep and how much that money then earns you. Thank you, Heather. Get the flamethrower. All right. I'm really, really excited. So I'm Johnny FD. My talk today is going to be about a very important topic that is called fire. And just like for our ancestors, the cavemen, fire was very, very important. But this type of fire, this acronym, is actually even more important in the digital age for all of us location independent entrepreneurs and kind of just different, kind of the next gen generation of workers. Who here actually knows what the acronym FIRE stands for? You can scream it out. Awesome. I love that. So it definitely means financial independence, aka financial freedom, but really it's the option to retire early. It doesn't necessarily mean we work our butts off for 40, 50 years and we are so exhausted, we just sit on a beach in Phuket and do nothing. We sit on the beach with our laptops. <laughs> no. Uh, it's the, having the option to be able to either not work at all, to take a break, that's much needed, or like what I do and what Johannes does and what a lot of uh, people do that don't need that, you know, that, that monthly paycheck anymore to just kind of grind away and sell our souls, we can work on projects that we actually love doing. So whether that's you know, pursuing music, le uh, learning languages, learning new skills, learning new hobbies, creating communities, this is, gives us the option to be able to work on things that we really love doing. And plus we all know that there's too much glare to actually work on the beach anyways. So this is a very serious question I want everyone to take a minute to think about. If you had to, for some reason, stop working tomorrow, <laughs> whether you, know, you got bit by a mosquito and got dengue fever, you jumped off a, a yacht in Croatia during Yacht Week and broke your back, you're riding your scooter over a, a dark uh, rice paddy in Bali and fell off into the ditch and broke your neck, got hit by a tuk-tuk while driving Colanta. <laughs> And as morbid as these things are, these are things that have actually happened to people I know. And one of those guys, he was laying in bed for four months with a broken back. And if it wasn't for his online business that continued to generate money, he would have been screwed. And instead, he was literally laying in his hospital bed with a projector to, his <laughs> to the ceiling not only watching Netflix, which he did a lot of, but actually running his business. That is something that has never been possible before this. So I want you to take a second and just seriously think, if for whatever reason you had to stop working tomorrow, how long can you actually go for financially? Is it a few months? Is it a few years? Now, the, I want to give a couple of examples of people who may either be in this room or people that you may know in the digital nomad community or even back home to really just get, understand this math because it's important. The first, we'll call him Bootstrapping Benjamin. And imagine Ben, he makes about $1,000 a month, but for whatever reason, he ha ha that, that income dried up. He was freelancing, he was writing, uh, he was teaching English online, and he just had to stop. He has about a thousand dollars in total net worth, most likely from selling his bicycle or whatever rolly possessions he has. And his expenses are about a thousand bucks a month. How long can Benjamin continue living his current lifestyle before he's completely broke? Easy, one month. Now, next example, Rich Rochelle. She was balling, she was making five Gs a month, but you know, and not, she didn't really save that much money or invest that much money, but luckily she owned her own house or a condo and she paid that off, so she was building equity. 
And this might be an example of someone you know back home, uh, or maybe you in a past life. And it's great, she has a nice house, she's built up some equity, uh, and for, and, but her expenses are high. She's spending about $5,000 a month. So if for whatever reason, she lost her job or she couldn't work anymore, she could probably take out home uh, equity line of credit, she can probably sell the house and get that 100 grand out. But $100,000 sounds like a lot of money, but how long can that actually support her current lifestyle? We gotta do some math now. 20 months? Yep, one and a half years. That's actually not that long for 100 grand. Now, another example, this guy's really balling, Jet Set and Jimmy. He was making 20 grand a month. Maybe he was an SEO and an affiliate. Uh, but he, and, you know, he was smart enough to save some money. He was, a, you know, he was scared to invest it, but he just had all this cash uh, in a bank account somewhere, maybe in Singapore and Hong Kong. But he's spending 10 grand a month. He's popping bottles. He's renting villas in Bali. He's you know, flying business class everywhere. And he's spending $10,000 a month, which is actually what people do when they start making more money. How many people here think that you will never do that, you never waste money, but you know people who make a lot of money and just spend it all. Pretty much everyone here. And they just, it's just like a natural thing, all right? It's called lifestyle creep, where the more you make, the more we spend. So even though this guy has a quarter of a million dollars in the bank, how long can he continue to live his current lifestyle before that's all gone? You don't even have to do math, it's up there. Yellow it out. <laughs> Two years. How are you gonna retire off of that? Well, here is today's, the topic of today's talk. It's the difference between being rich and being wealthy. I used to not know either rich or wealthy people. I grew up, you know, a child of two you know, immigrants in San Francisco, and I didn't know any of the tech millionaires. And I've been very fortunate in the last couple of years, I've expanded my network through a lot of things like events like this, through hosting podcasts. And I've now been very fortunate to meet a lot of people who have sold businesses for a few million dollars or have made a few million dollars you know, running you know, online businesses. A lot of the speakers that you met today have either made a million dollars or sold a business for a million dollars, which is really amazing. I've also met their friends. And here's the thing, it's just because someone looks rich, or even if they made a lot of money or make a lot of money, it doesn't necessarily mean they're wealthy. And there's a big, big difference between the two, which we're gonna go into right now. So a lot of us think we want things that money can buy us. Back home, it'd be nice cars, maybe nice fancy clothes, maybe status. You know, to go to a club, you'd be able to skip the line, pop some bottles, have the the flame going up, the sparklers, you guys have seen that, right? And maybe have an expensive handbag, or expensive shoes. But I think we're very lucky that all of us have traveled a little bit, and usually what that does is it kind of makes us realize those are the things that we thought were important, but once we kind of expand our minds a bit, we realize that's not what we really want. That's not what really makes us happy. So what is it that really makes us happy? What is freedom? Is it freedom of time? Freedom of resources? Freedom to do what we love? It's all of that. And originally I actually wanted to just do one of those Braveheart moments like, what do we want? Freedom. What do we need? Freedom. Actually, that's pretty good, thanks for that. <laughs> but we do, I think we all just deeply inside want freedom. And I want you to know, financial freedom at least, is attainable. It's really just having enough income coming in through either investment income or passive income to cover our expenses. And there's two ways to do that. Lower your expenses or invest your savings. That's it. But how do we do that? That's where this acronym FIRE comes in. There's really three ways 
to make our income higher than our expenses. And when I say income, I don't mean active working income, because if you're working and you're trading time for money, if you stop working, what happens? It dries up within a year or two, no matter how much money you make. And that's why rich people go broke. I'm gonna predict right now that Floyd Money Mayweather, who makes like $50 million every time he steps into a ring, is gonna go broke in our lifetime. And it's like, you think about these celebrities and these you know, sports figures, and you're like, how did they go broke? They made hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's simply, they don't do math. They're spending more than they're bringing in. And they think they're gonna keep bringing in that money forever so they can just spend forever. But that's not true for anybody, especially when things happen. So we're gonna explore the three ways where you can actually have your income be higher than your expenses. The first we wanna explore is passive income, because this is kind of the easiest you know, thing that we hear about all the time. So I wanna introduce you to Passive Income Pete. This guy, he has an online business, he's making 1,000 bucks a month, and he's spending 1,000 bucks a month. If everything kind of continues, how long can Passive Income Pete go for? Forever, and that's amazing. And it sounds like, oh, easy, I'll just become Pete. <laughs> and I tried to become Pete. I, I spent the last couple of years just developing different streams of passive income. And I have a talk on YouTube called My Different Income Streams. And I had like 18 different passive income streams from courses on Udemy, from my YouTube channel, from uh, two books that I saw on Amazon, to a bunch of other random things. And a lot of them do make close to a thousand bucks a month, or at least a couple hundred bucks a month. And if they just continued forever, I would never have to work again. However, turns out, if you don't update these things, what ends up happening? They slowly dry down. As much as I would like to think I wrote a classic novel that's gonna be read by people for generations, it, it's, it, if I never update it, if I never talk about it again, probably people probably won't buy it after a few years. And I've seen that income kind of slowly dip down. It went from making $600 a month to 200 to 100 and now sometimes I get like 50 bucks a month per book. And it doesn't mean that it was a waste of my time because I was smart enough to invest in all that money. And that's something I'm gonna talk about later. But I can't assume that you know, God with the wind, Johnny FD style, is gonna <laughs> sell forever because it's not God with the wind. And everything ends up kind of changing, all right? So let's, let's talk about what the difference is between these three categories. Active income, semi-passive income, and truly passive income. So there's some things that we, nomads might call passive income, but it really isn't, all right? These are things that are clearly active income. Freelancing, consulting, coaching, teaching, anything that you're paying, getting paid hourly for, or monthly for, or it's like a one-off thing. Right? We can't even kid ourselves, right? We might make it online, it might be location independent. They might send us the, the check or the order while we're sleeping, but it really isn't passive income at all. But then we have things that are either semi-passive or somewhat passive, like my book sales, or royalties from something, or my YouTube channel. And, and the reason why these are semi-passive or the videos that actually make the most money aren't the videos I just made this week or last month, are videos that I made years ago. I have one video that I filmed in 2009 or something called Building a Bamboo Hut in Phuket. And I literally just filmed someone building a bamboo hut because I thought it was cool. And then the eco, you know, the eco trend kind of kicked in. People are like, oh, that's cool. I want to see how to build a bamboo hut. And that literally makes me money every month. But that was also filmed in 480p, which means with new 4K TVs, it looks like trash. And I'm, I'm, almost, I'm surprised that people still watch it, but they do. But I guarantee in a few years, that when 8K comes out, or 12K or 20K, nobody's gonna watch it anymore. Uh, same with like courses, My, like whether you have an e-commerce store, FBA store, it may feel kind of passive because you do all the work kind of up front, the orders come in while you're sleeping, but if you just never 
add to it, it's just gonna slowly drop. And even things like apps, right? You can create an app or a game, and it might sell passively for months, maybe even years. But if you never update that app, and Apple comes out with iOS 20, or Android comes out with, with you know, Android, I don't know, well, I don't even know how they name it now, <laughs> like <laughs> spaghetti ice cream. It, it's not, like it just, it, it will stop bringing money in. So what is true passive income? It's really only things that if you, for whatever reason, never logged into again, never touched again, whether you died, you forgot your password, <laughs> you forgot that you owned it, if that continued to make money forever, despite of what you did, that is truly passive income. And that's usually forever income, or at least close to be. And a lot of that is things like having stocks, or having bonds, having like index funds, or having dividends, or interest that you're collecting, some types of real estate, you know, maybe like real estate investment trusts. But here's the thing, is almost all that involves money. Money makes money. And we know this because rich people with generational wealth, what happens to their kids? They keep making money, like in despite of what they do. Like how many of the rich kids that inherit money are actually geniuses with their money? Very few of them. But how, do them, how many of them continue to be rich? Pretty much all of them, because when you bring, that money is making that much money, it's actually hard to spend it all. So even though all these examples seem like they would be great ways to retire early or retire ever, they're not. And that's why they look like that. And I spent way too much time photoshopping <laughs> their expressions. So I hope you appreciate this. So uh, then how do we actually do it? All right. If it's not passive income, what is it? And really, it's either investment income or something called a drawdown, when you just take a small piece of how much your total net worth is and hope that whatever it's earning is higher. The problem, though, with investment income alone is things fluctuate. The stock market fluctuates. Things change. So really, what's the only super reliable way to know that you can retire ever is to withdraw, let's say, 4% while you're earning 5% or more. And for all the nerds that are asking, what about inflation, what about uh, things like that, don't worry, there's a lot of bigger super nerds who have done this math. Don't worry about trying to read this, but I've done the math myself just to really figure it out. And because I know that even though I might happily live off of 30 grand a year now, in five, 10 years, as things get more expensive, there's no way I can do that. So you need to add for inflation, which is usually about 2% or so. But what's nice about this math is as long as you're earning 5% or more, which I'll show you in a second, it's actually very, very possible, even if you just put your money into the stock market and, and you diversify, that money will probably never run out in our generation. There's like a 99% likelihood that it's gonna last for 30, 40, 50 years, and we may be able to pass that down to our, our future children or to a charity or you know, whatever you want uh, that money to go to. So I wanted to give you guys a couple examples of things that make more than 5%. This is my Vanguard fund. It's an uh, index fund, which basically just means it's buying a little bit of every single stock uh, out there. Uh, it's mostly the US stocks, but I also have international stocks in there just to be more diversified. And in the five years I've had it, it's brought an average return rate of 9.9%, which is pretty good, because Vanguard has very, very low fees. It just continues to go. And if you look at just the US stock market or like the S&P 500, which is basically the top 500 biggest uh, companies in the US, it's returned an average of 8.7% for the last like 50, 70 years, but basically as long as I've been tracking it. And the fees are low, it's just kind of easy, you don't have to think about it, as long as you don't sell it when, it when it's down. And things happen, things go down. And I've, I've been very unlucky, in a sense, where when I first had my first money to invest back in 2013, what happened? It dropped. <laughs> and I thought, crap! That 
you know, that 10 grand I had is now worth eight grand. And that hurt a lot. Luckily, I had a plan in place. I knew it was a long-term thing. It wasn't just a short-term, you know, trading or anything, right? And I knew I just had to stick with it. And every month for the last five years, I put $3,000 a month in like clockwork, automatic, never touch it, never think about it when it's up or down. And what's really amazing is in total, I put in $170,000, which sounds insane, right? Like if, if you said, like a lot of you are probably thinking, I don't have $170,000. Well, I didn't either. But I had $1,000 and I was like, all right, if I'm gonna invest this thousand, maybe I can start a business to make 4,000. If I can live off a thousand bucks, I have those extra 3,000 to invest. And even as I started making more money, I just kept putting that money in. So I wanna give you guys an example of someone who's made it, who's someone whose fire story is attainable. Fela is on 4% fire, which means she can withdraw 4% of her total net worth every single year for the rest of her life, and she can basically retire now, or have the option to retire. So the math is pretty easy, right? She was making three grand a month, right? Maybe she was running an FBA store, a dropshipping store, a coaching business, a consulting business. She, had, she was writing books, she was a programmer, wh whatever it is, right? And she saved that, you know, 75% of her income, whatever, because she was living cheaply here in Thailand. And she just put all that away, invested all of it. And now uh, she has 300 grand. And this is a very attainable number for any of us who, you know, are planning for our retirements, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. But the key to it is she's only spending $1,000 a month, which is very easy to do in places like, like Chiang Mai. Like who here has lived for $1,000 a month or less here in Chiang Mai? All right, or anywhere, all right? It's, it's we're, we're lucky that this is actually possible. So if Fela had to stop working for any reason, how long can she survive? Forever, or pretty much, at least you know, 50, 40 years, all right? Now let's say, you know, Fela's like, has a kid or she wants to just ball out a little bit more, all right? And she wants to spend two grand a month living in Chiang Mai, which for a family, very easy to do, all right? All you do is double, double those numbers. Instead of having 300 grand in the bank or investments, you need 600 grand. Instead of having, uh, you know, $1,000 a month coming in, you have 2,000. Now, let's say you're like, you know what, that, that's not enough, right? I need, I, need to, I need to go out and have some steaks and I wanna travel in more expensive places. I wanna ball out a little bit like Fred here. What do you do? You just triple that number, all right? So now you need 900 grand. Now, now you can spend 300 grand a month. Now you might be thinking, well, that sounds good, but how do I get there? The key is these four things. One is lower your expenses or earn more money. And I think these are, this is when a lot of people stop listening, especially back home. But luckily, we're not with a bunch of people back in our home countries that have, they're a bit narrow-minded thinking, well, you know, nothing's possible. Here, I know, I believe every single person here knows that if you wanted to, you could lower your expenses. We don't have, you know, we're not living in New York or San Francisco where we're like, oh, that's impossible, All right? If we wanted to, we can move into a studio apartment in Chiang Mai. Maybe that's not something that we want to do, but it is possible. And we all know, and we've all learned so many techniques just even today on how to scale our business or earn more money. All right, did everyone here take away at least one tip where you can earn more money? Yeah, even in your current business? Yeah, everyone, every single person here. And if you weren't, watch the videos again because you missed something. <laughs> but here's the real key, and this is why I bolded it. It doesn't matter how much money you make, it's how much of that you keep and how much that money then earns you. And that's why it's important to have a high savings rate. And most importantly, it's to stay on track even when you're making more money. So here is an easy example of seeing this, right? Let's say you want to save 10% of your money. You're like, Johnny, I can't save 75% of my money. That's too much. That's fine. That's what most Americans do or most people back home do, right? They save 10% of their income, which isn't that hard to do, right? It takes, you can do it, and you retire in 51 years. And why is this important? It's because most of us are not going to be able to rely on 
the, thing, the retirement vehicles that our parents or our grandparents relied on. Like how many of us work for a company that's gonna give us a gold watch and a pension in 40 years? I don't think any of us. How many, how many of us trust our government to give us a pension or a social security check in 30, 40 years? Well, at least that's enough for us to survive. Probably none of us, all right? So it really is up to us to plan our own retirements because as much as we're enjoying life now, the worst thing that can happen is we just kind of go around, we're like, oh, life is great. You know, I'm living in this great villa in Bali and, um, and you know, my life looks amazing on Instagram. But then one day you wake up, you're 40 or 50 and you have nothing to show for it. And sure, we had some great travels, but at one point we're gonna have to, somebody's gonna have to take care of us. And if we don't have kids <laughs> that are nice enough, we're kind of on our own. So it really is up to us. So if we can save 20%, that brings it down to 37 years. If we can save 50%, 17 years. That's not bad. Most of us are pretty happy to continue living this lifestyle and saving half our income. And then retire in 17 years. We'll still be relatively young, still retiring early. But here's where the math really gets exciting. If you can save 70% of your income, right, if you're making 10 grand a month, you're you know, saving seven grand, you spend three grand, more than enough to live. And in nine years, you can retire, which is really, really cool. And we have so many tools that allow us to do that. And we're in a very unique position to be able to do it that other people cannot do even if they tried. All of us are taking advantage of location arbitrage. How many of you even this last week, bought something or ate something, you're like, man, that was a good deal. That would have been like four times the price back home. I can get a cleaner to clean that up. I, I don't have a cleaner back home. How many of us are taking advantage of low cost of living here? All right. And how many of us are kind of forced into minimalism? I mean, we just can't buy a bunch of stuff, right? Like, how many of you wanted to buy something on Amazon, but you're like, oh, well, I can't ship it here. <laughs> so you just don't buy it, right? And how many of you guys learned or already do all these tax breaks, like our sponsor, Moore's Roland, talked about? How many of you don't have a car payment anymore? How amazing is that? You know how much money the average American spends on their car every year, just owning one? $7,500. And what is that? That's depreciation for the car, or interest that they're paying, or maintenance, gas, insurance, speeding tickets, tolls, parking tickets. These are things that we kind of forget about sometimes. And we're able to even go without you know, paying $400 a month for insurance in the US. And the thing is, now I pay like 400 bucks a year just having travel insurance. And this has allowed me to have a super high savings rate of 75% or more. Because my cost of living, even today, is way less than 1,500 bucks a month, which was my rent back in the US. And on the plus side, and those are ways to save money, which we could all do, and most of us are already doing. But on the plus side, we have the high savings rate, we can all bootstrap a new business, and we all have the skills on how to do that now. And we can grow that business with the skills that we've learned today or throughout you know, our time as an entrepreneur, and we can sell that business for big multiples and invest that money. So we have so many tools that our parents didn't have, that our grandparents didn't have. So my financial independence goal, and this is something I want everyone to know your goals as well, is to make $2,500 a month with my 4% drawdown. And I came to that number because I know that I spend about $1,500 a month, and I want to give my parents well, actually, I want to continue to give my parents $1,000 a month. 
And I've been doing that now for the last three years, which has been a very, very good encouragement for me to continue making more money. And I know that for me to have that goal, or to be able to hit that goal, I need to have $750,000. And if you asked me four years ago or five years ago here in Chiang Mai, maybe when I was hanging out with Nate at the Paleo House, I would have said, you are crazy. There is zero chance I'll ever have that much money. I barely had $1,000 back then. I remember actually calling my cousin who was, he, he was a, like a deputy DA back in the US. So the kind of the guy I knew that made the most amount of money. He made six figures, he made $100,000 a year living in California. And I said, Larry, I'm, I just started this business, I'm in Thailand, and I'm running out. And I really wanna give this a shot because if I move home, I'll never have this chance again. And I said, if I call you in a month, can you lend me the money to buy a plane ticket to go home? And I promise you, I'll live with my parents, I'll get a job, I'll put you back. And I'm, I'm lucky to have good family, not, not all of us do. But he said, yeah, no problem. But then he said, just give me a few weeks notice so I can get that, you know, I can clear that money up. And I was like, what? Like, you don't just have it? This guy made $100,000 a year, and he didn't have $1,000 in the bank? But here's the thing. Do you know how many Americans ha have less than $1,000 in savings? Like, I think it's more than a third. And these are people including, you know, people in their 40s or 50s that should be retiring soon, or people who make 100 grand or more. And that really was a big wake-up call. I was like, man, I'm probably not gonna make 100 grand a year when I move back to SF. And if this guy, the, the richest guy I know, has this kind of life where he doesn't even have 100, I mean, one, not even 100 grand, one grand to just, you know, for an emergency, like what kind of life am I going back to? And that's when I knew I had to do something here. So what did I do? I saved between 75 to 90% of everything I earned for the last six, seven years now, since 2013. People ask me, why do I still live in a $250 a month apartment here in Chiang Mai? That's like 7,000 something baht. And I think sometimes my friends, some of them are in this room, <laughs> come over and they're like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you in a studio apartment? And I'm like, I like it here. I'm 100% happy. I live right on Neiman, near Salad Concept. I can walk everywhere. I have a big couch. I have a flat screen TV. I have a king size bed. I have a nice balcony. I just like it. I'm 100% happy. I'm not impressing anyone, but it's everything I need. And here's kind of a hard thing to explain is the little bit of sacrifice that I give to not have a super luxury place where I can show it off and just be like, yeah, I'll check out my, my penthouse. That little bit of sacrifice gives me so much upside. Upside for the rest of my life. And this has allowed me to just spend between $600 to $1,200 a month on average for the last seven years even when I was making 10, 20 grand a month sometimes. And it's allowed me to just live off of kind of just the actual money I was, I was earning actively. And every time I would have these passive income projects, which I was, I was starting, because I really thought that was the key. I was like, okay, if I just create this course on Udemy, or if I just write another book, or if I just create a YouTube channel, that's gonna give me enough money forever. And it turns out, <laughs> You know, I didn't really understand the math back then. I just thought, I really thought it would last forever. But luckily, I was able to just save all that. So, you know, even though my Udemy courses only make me about 100 bucks a month now, in total, it's made me 20 grand. And because I didn't actually need any of that to live off of, I invested all $20,000 of it. And this is a course that I filmed in pun space with my ex-girlfriend, who was an English teacher back then, on small talk just like this random course on Udemy that sells for like 10 bucks. 
my YouTube channel has now made me $8,000. And it's literally videos like how to build a eco-friendly bamboo hut. <laughs> These are all filmed on my iPhone. And when I was making a lot of money with my e-commerce stores, I didn't spend any of it. You know, once in a while, I think I, even when I sold, I sold a, one of my dropshipping stores for $60,000. And I was like, this is more money than I've ever seen in my life. So I went out, and I was like, all right, I gotta celebrate. So I went out and bought this gold watch. But it's, instead of spending 10 grand on a Rolex, I went to Cats and Cow, that old mall, and I bought the Citizen for 175 bucks. <laughs> I went out to a really, really nice dinner, like the nicest restaurant in Chiang Mai, DK's Kitchen. Anyone been there? It's good. It's like really good food. But it's Chiang Mai, so it's like a thousand baht. And I was like, all right, still got $59,900. <laughs> what should I do? And I feel a bit silly saying this now, but I really wanted to buy some Gucci loafers for whatever stupid reason. <laughs> But turns out, Chiang Mai doesn't have a Gucci store. <laughs> so what did I do instead? I went to the night market and I bought a pair of like $2 flip-flops. <laughs> so I almost accidentally invested the rest of it because I didn't know what else to do with it. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this talk today is maybe you won't be so lucky. Maybe you won't be living in Chiang Mai. Maybe you wouldn't have grown up with frugal immigrant parents that just like drilled this saving mentality into you, maybe there will be a Gucci store opening up in Maya. And if it wasn't for this kind of accidental knowledge I've stumbled upon now, or just getting lucky like I did, I probably would have spent all of it and I'd be screwed. There would be no Nomad Summit today. If I didn't have the money in the bank and, and savings and the investment income coming in, and I had to actively work for it, I would have just shut it down. I'd be like, all right, well, lost money last time, so I guess I can't afford to do this again. And none of us would be able to connect today, or at least in this kind of big platform and learn from each other. So this is why it's so important to keep your savings rate high regardless of how much money you're making, especially when you're making a lot. The biggest problem in the fire movement, at least in the US, is people only focus on saving money. And there's only so much more money you can save. If you're only making, you know, a thousand bucks a month, the most you can save is a thousand bucks. But if you can increase that using the techniques that you learned today from all the different speakers, and you can grow that business, you can leverage it, you can scale it up, and if you can continue spending a thousand bucks a month and just save the rest of it. And that is really the big secret of retiring not only just early, but just ever. So what loopholes did I follow? Location or arbitrage, living in cheap places like Chiang Mai, just having less stuff. I, I literally travel with a 60 liter soft duffel and I, I just don't own anything else. I can't buy anything else because every time I buy something, I have to get rid of something. So I just don't buy anything. I live super frugally. I spent $850 last month. And it's not because I couldn't spend more, it's just because I'm 100% happy. And anyone who knows me personally, you know I'm happy. Like, I, like, check my Instagram, I'm just, every day I'm like, I cannot believe how good this buffet is. <laughs> I can't believe this like, pork bone soup was 45 baht. And like, I think just part of me just enjoys getting good deals. So, it's not like I'm sacrificing, you know, and maybe some of you aren't willing to go as, you know, as frugal as that, but these are possibilities. I take advantage of every single tax loophole there is. I wasn't living in the US, I wasn't living in California since like 2008, and I was still paying them tax. And it didn't really matter when I was making like, you know, 300 bucks a month. <laughs> But then when I started making more money, I was like, why am I paying California's freaking thousands of dollars a year? Like seven you know, to 10 grand a year. So I moved to Texas, yeehaw. <laughs> and then I was like, well, why am I even paying the US money? I'm not even there. So I moved my company to Belize. 
unbelievable LLC. <laughs> and when I travel, I, I do it with purpose. I don't just go places just to go places. I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna do Nomad Summit here. I'm gonna expense that. I'm gonna go you know, to Mexico, do Nomad Summit there. I'm gonna go to Tbilisi, do Nomad Summit there. Or even just like go visit uh, suppliers or potential suppliers, have meetings, go to, go to conferences. Every single one of you can write off your trip as a business expense because this is a business conference. That includes your hotel, your Airbnb, some of your meals, if you're just eating with each other, having meetings. Talk, talk to the tax guys. I haven't had a car payment in like 10 years, and I haven't had to pay you know, four or 500 bucks a month for insurance. And, and I haven't paid car insurance in the same amount of time. That's allowed me to have a super high savings rate of 75 to 90%. It's allowed me to boot, have the time to be able to bootstrap multiple businesses, which allowed me to have the time to learn how to scale it up, grow them, and then sell them. It's allowed me to create multiple streams of income. And that's allowed me to just build and flip businesses. I've now sold four dropshipping stores anywhere between thirty dollars to $60,000 each. And I took all that money and I just invested it because I, I didn't really need it to live anyways. And most importantly, that's allowed me to buy investments which continue to earn money. But really what has made it all possible is just repeating what had worked. I didn't do it for a year and then just decide, you know, I'm just gonna go you know, ball out for a while. I just was consistent with it. And so I showed you the slide earlier, but I don't know how many of you actually noticed this other number. It wasn't just the fact that I invested or I was able to save up $170,000, which is money that otherwise I probably would have just spent if I lived in the US or somewhere where I actually had a Gucci store. That money is like little minion workers. And that money has now earned me $84,000. That's more money than my parents have made in like four years of their life at the peak of working. And this is money that I don't have to work for anymore. It just continues. As long as you don't spend it or sell it, it just continues. And it's pretty well diversified. It's 3,000 different US stocks and a few thousand international stocks. So unless the entire world just collapses, which in that case, we would have other problems anyways, it'll eventually just keep going up. It might not, you know, it probably won't keep going up at 9% or 9.9. .9. It might, or it might even be higher. It might fluctuate down and up, but that's just the way the world works. But in general, as long as the economy keeps growing, there's, you know, a more higher population, there's more efficiency in the market, you know, people keep creating businesses and buying stuff, you know, where somebody has money to buy stuff, maybe it's China next time. It just, in general, it just keeps going up. So right now, I really want everyone to just take a minute and just calculate what is your five. What is the number that you need to one day retire? And don't think it needs to happen this year or next year. Maybe in 10 years or 20 years, it doesn't matter. Just we need to know what that number is because if you don't have a goal, you'll never get there. The easy way to calculate it is simple. All right, take your annual spend, so whatever your monthly spend is right now, times 12, and then just multiply by 25. All right. Everybody have that number? If not, we have a couple of examples here because I know it's getting late in the afternoon. <laughs> if you want to spend, or if you want to have $1,500 a month coming in off of just your investments, you need to have the fine number, the financial independent number of 450K. And remember, even it's not that you're gonna get 1,500 for the rest of your life, that number is gonna go up by 2% every single year probably for the rest of your life. And if you get lucky, maybe that, that, that money will never run out and you can pass it down to your kids to give them an easier time, will create generational wealth. Maybe you can leave all that to your spouse or you can leave it to a foundation or a charity of your choice and make the world a better place. So figure out what your FI is. If anyone wants to kind of know 
how you actually build your business scaled up so you can earn more and be able to save more, listen to my podcast, Travel Like a Boss. I've interviewed now over 240 entrepreneurs, a lot of them who are in this room, a lot of the speakers, and just ask them, like, how did you get started? What did you do? What works for you? And literally, there's hundreds of different businesses. Because what had worked for me maybe isn't the path for you. Maybe you should become a programmer, like Steph mentioned. Maybe you should get into Amazon, like Nate did. Maybe you should you know, uh, create some, probably not in German market, but in another language, <laughs> therapy books in Norwegian or in Spanish, like Johannes did. There's so many different options out there. And what's really cool about the Nomad community is people are very open to sharing what has worked. And I'm very, very fortunate to have met those people who have mentored me or helped me along the way, which is why I love giving that back. So you can take a listen to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. And if you want to learn more about investing in general, I started a podcast with my buddy Sam Marks, who uh, is here today as well, who actually sold his business for about $100 million. And I met him here in Chiang Mai, which is crazy. Obviously, he had partners, so he didn't keep all of it, but he wanted to start that because his financial advisor was just screwing him. And he wanted to learn how to be able to invest his money. And together, we now have over 100 episodes with some of the smartest people out there and really just a case study on what we did and what they're doing. So take a listen to those two. You can follow my blog, johnnyfd.com. But really, I want all of you to leave today and this talk and this weekend with just knowing what that five number is because if you have that as a goal, it's achievable. Thank you. Jerry, what's your question? <laughs> I like that. So, um, oh, they're very low. So I've got two. One second. By the way, Jerry and the, all the VIPs, I really do appreciate you guys because just like having uh, like first class or business class on a plane, it ends up subsidizing kind of the rest of the seats. So this is why you guys aren't paying $400 for, for the other seats, it's because of these guys. So big thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, so you mentioned, I, I like the way you broke down the three types of income, the active, the semi-passive, and the truly passive. I actually have an Amazon merch account and I logged out for two years because I got frustrated with how much power Amazon had. It actually slowed down my sales, but it was still making sales all that time. But like you said, it went down and then it would spike during Halloween. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of, I guess, know more. And I think you're doing a workshop tomorrow as well. Are you going to go into more detail about like the truly passive stuff? Um, also, the chart that you had about how long it would take to retire. And then the last one you said, if you're saving 70%, um, at 10k a month. When I was working in London as a software developer, I was making 10k a month, but I did not save at 70%. I don't know where the money went. But um, I still have a lot of friends that are making that or more. Um, so I find that really interesting that it only takes nine years to retire. Is there something more to that? Yeah, so I got that, that graph from a guy named Money, Mr. Money Mustache, which is a terrible name, but he's a very smart guy. <laughs> And there's, in the fire, the fire movement, there are so many people that just love to geek out on spreadsheets. So you can take a, if you just kind of uh, look that up, there's, there, the math behind it is, it works. I, I checked it out, it's legit. But the thing is, th that's kind of the key, is most people that we know don't save 70% of their income. Most people don't save anything. I remember when I was living in the US, I was making 50 grand a year for Honeywell, this big US corporation. My savings rate, was probably like 1%, because my goal was to save $250 a month, which I only did on the months that I <laughs> just had money left over, which wasn't very often. So you're good, what you said was a good example. How many people do we all know that make a lot of money, but don't save any of it? Even if you're making 100 grand a year, how many people aren't saving any of it? And that's the, the big key. And the last thing that you can take away um, is, yeah, so I came to this conference three years ago. Fresh, I heard about Chiang Mai through your podcast. I just finished like a stressful contract. So I had a lot of money, 
wanted to escape, came here, everything was cheap. Um, and I remember back then, I think you had just retired your mum. And that kind of inspired me. So that's now my goal as well. So I just want to say thank you for that as well. Thank you. I appreciate that.